welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Radiation Burn, creator of the Sar the Saril, um, I'd, I'd say almost universalist um, role-playing game, the one and only Graham Stewart. How are you doing today, man? I am very good, thank you. Yeah, kind of cold, actually, but that's about the, the only problem. Well, whenever it's not, it's not even, it's not even January yet. Though, then, then again, whenever, whenever anyone from the UK looks at the types of winter I have to deal with it in like January and February, they look at me like I'm crazy. Or I just bring, or I just bring up the polar vortex, and they look at me like I'm ridiculously crazy. All you can say is, at least it's not Canada. <laughs> um, I'm not far off. True, true. But like I've I've seen I've I've gotten reports about about um UK, about UK winters and comparatively speaking it's almost quaint. Well it just changes every day all the time. Well the you get cold cold days in summer and hot days in winter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I've had the running joke of if you don't like the weather, wait ten minutes. Yeah. Uh but the I think the I think the worst was that polar vortex where it was like minus fifty three Celsius. Yeah, that sounds pretty cold. Mm -hmm. Certainly yeah. wouldn't go skinny dipping in it. <laughs> I have done the polar bear plunge, and <laughs> at least the only Instant reason regret. <laughs> oh. Well, well, you're ju you're ju you're you're ta you're taking a dip into in in a frozen lake with the with the um hole cut in the ice, um. At least it's it's a yearly charity thing, which is the which I think is the main reason I can talk myself into doing it. Is be is because it's a charity event. Yeah. Oh, uh, but. Part of one tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what made it stick. Oh, it, it well, it's like Velcro it comes on and off. Um, so when I was very young, started with D and D. Obviously, that was the first one. Um, what made it stick was it's just the adventure. You, you get sick of the rules, but the adventure. Is always there with your friends. The, the thing about tabletop RPGs that's very different from from video games is that anything can happen. Mm -hmm. And as a DM, I always liked the idea that anything could happen. So I always rolled in the open, and I'll get arguments from that. And I I never want to know how things are going to turn out. I love finding out with the players how things are going to turn out. I know I create lots of characters and know how the, all the characters will act and what they want and what they work towards. But whether they succeed or not, I I don't want to know that. I loved finding out. Uh, when the players do, you get you get crazy situations, you get dramatic situations, and it's always a nice surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what really stuck. So uh, yeah, I started showing my age here oh, about twenty five years ago, probably when I was in high school. And there have been times where I've, I've drifted away from it when you're moving to new areas and you don't have the friend groups, and then you build it up again, and someone suggests something, and then somehow always end up being the GM. Mm -hmm. And and you get lots lots of feedback from players over years and years, and then complaints from players over years and years of why they didn't play or they would play F and they did this F or why can't I do this? Such as oh he's going to fire a fireball at me. Well I'm going to jump out the way and someone says oh you can't. It's not your turn. Well why why can't you? And the answer is well realistically you can. And there's no reason. Well I found mechanically there was no reason that, that couldn't happen, which is one of the very many things that makes Sarl a bit strange. But I find that it's, people, once they've played it, find it very intuitive. It makes sense to them. Especially people who are coming across from, say, video game backgrounds. Yeah. They tend to like that a lot. I, um, before I, before I did this podcast, I 
had a whole, had a whole thing of teaching people how to play at, um, various TTRPGs, and something I've half jokingly said said in the past is that my best students are ones that did not have a TTRPG background. They had a background in, say, video games or co or comic book or comic books or television. Oh yeah, they don't have expertise. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right because. When, when I was doing all the beta tests, then people who had spent a long time playing something like D Dungeons & Dragons, um, they'd come in and they'd wonder about when it was their turn to roll. Because um, it was easy enough to say, oh, the, the bad guys are doing this, and then ask the players, okay, what are you guys only going to do about it? But then they'd still have the mindset for quite a while um, of when it was their turn to roll. And the answer is, no, everyone just rolls at once. You sort it out afterwards. And the the big the big reason that I've I've sta I've stated that is uh, a lot of people a lot of people when they when they've played a, when they've played if they've played a certain game for years on end they develop a degree of inflexibility or or a degree of expectations on how things are supposed to work. Um, my favorite story when it comes to that was. I do a lot of one shots and the like at my LGS, and one day we were I was running Lex Arcana, mm -hmm. which is an interesting beast to co um, coming out of Italy. But I had made explicitly clear this is an investigation based game. Do not play a do not play a combat focused character when you when you build your character. I was explicitly clear on that, and there was one person who did not quite get it, and beca because because of the fact that Lex Arcana is themed around this alternate history Roman Empire, he thought that he was going to go full gladiator or something. And I said, <laughs> even though I even though I specifically said multiple times, no, this isn't going to be that kind of story. If you, I'm not going to stop you if you decide to make a combat heavy character. But you are going to be on the back foot, and it's going to be your own damn fault. Yeah, I mean, it was nice of you to give them the warning. I've been in situations where there's no warning given. Um, I handled that actually by explicitly doing I mean, the skills that are essential and skills that will be useful. There is a section in Sarah that, that deals with exactly that problem. You're setting it's a setup for a one shot. So, so it's a one page setup. And it has how you set your character up. It says what there's a it's just a list of the skills that they should put things into, and ones that are essential for the group, ones that all the individuals will have, and then some that might be fun for occasions. But yeah, so I know exactly what you're talking about. There's been so many times where people have made characters that just have inappropriate skill sets. It's not it's not just malicious either, because there's plenty of times where a DM will pick up a one shot, say in Call of Cthulhu, and he says, "Okay, just make up your characters." And there's so many odds and sods in terms of skills, there's a decent chance that things just won't come up. Or things that you think won't come up will come up. Like uh, the accounting skill as such. I don't know how much you know about Call of oh, Cthulhu, but probably a fair I bit. Am, yep. Um, cause I, <laughs> and of, co of course, um, just, lo just looking at the character sheet setup that you, ha that you have, um, I appreciate that knowledge of its own um, own separate area when it comes to skills, because knowledge skills is one of those pet peeves of, of mine where it en it ends up being this highly situational sink. Since um, since it's still it's still in a lot of games that have it, it's still utilizing that same po that same setup, but because it has because separate fields are treated as their own skill checks. Um, yeah, it, it was again. It was something that was requested. Knowledge and craft are two types of skills in some games that can really result in a lot of bloat. Yep. You know because you because you have to put in a description for each for each one of them. But with the, now with that in mind, you've you've established the simultaneous um, approach. But one thing that I'm one thing that I'd um, like to nail down first and foremost is kind of the Rome with Saril. 
i.e. all all roads lead to Rome, which is a concept I've brought up in, in the past. Basically, for the last for the last few decades, there's been the, there's been this mindset of a particular type of die setup or a particular mechanic that is central that is central to everything, and all the all the other mechanics some um, are variations or branch out from it. Hence, all roads mm -hmm. lead to Rome. Um, what sort? What is the what is the default um, die setup when it comes to dealing with an action that may have a success or failure chance? Well, you're absolutely right. It all lords lead to Rome because if you pay a lot of attention to the rules, you'll see that it's pretty much the same one rule that's applied to every single situation. It's just how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the The one rule is if you have a skill of four, for example, you would roll four d6, the default's d6, uh, unless you specifically go off and change it. So say say d6. I've got four right here. So you, if you were fighting a goblin, say the guy says, oh, the goblin's coming to attack the closest player. What is the player going to do about it? So there's one player, and he's a swordsman. He's got a skill of four. He would roll these four dice, same time that the goblin rolled his, and all he would do is he'd put the highest dice next to the goblin's dice. And the damage would just be the difference between the highest dice plus whatever modifiers are on the weapon. Which the default is plus one. So you're, the, rolling this, a pool, you're rolling a pool and you're keeping the highest. Yes, but there are two catches. The first catch is that you don't have to roll them all. Okay? So you could roll two, but hold the other two back in your hand. You don't need to tell anyone you're doing this, but if you only roll two dice, you've got the other two in your hand, and those each give a plus one to all the other dice. So if you rolled a four and a six, you'd actually have a score of six and eight. So you can roll and be more focused, mm -hmm. but you're adding randomness to it with a higher possibility of a better hit, but uh, more of a chance of getting it wrong as well. Mm -hmm. Additionally, on, on top of that, see we have two cowboys. I'll use the, the one from the, the demo. Mm -hmm. Two cowboys, and they each have a skill of four. So they want to shoot at each other and stand off. So they both draw and shoot. They need a score of six to hit. Uh, so they could roll four dice or they could roll three. So you're wondering what's the optimal. But there's a catch, which is the, the number of dice you roll is the speed of the action. Mm -hmm. So if someone rolls four dice and they're lucky to get a six, they're going to shoot the other guy before he gets a shot off, even if he got a score of eight by rolling two dice. And on top of that, say you're in melee combat, you've got your four dice again. If you're fighting against four monsters, you would assign one of those, one of each of your four dice to one of the four monsters. So you fight multiple people just by assigning dice. So if you've got a skill of four, you can fight two people relatively safely, two minions relatively safely, or risky and go for four. Uh, which is why someone who's really crap at fighting and he only has one die can step in and save your ass if there's a fifth guy, because otherwise that fifth guy would just get a free hit on you. Mm -hmm. That that's the that's the core around it. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, would you, especially with the varying genres of some of the modules that I saw on the Kickstarter, would you consider um, Sorrow to be a universalist game? Uh, well, it depends how you define that. Um, I I've built it specifically for adventures. Mm -hmm. it's, the core idea of it is it's around adventures. It's not really around themes. It, it's around setting up an adventure and going for it. If you think in the ideas of, of movies or rather than settings, you can have a setting, that's fine, but I don't say, oh, go and make loads of worlds. That's up to yeah. you. Make an adventure and play the adventure. Yeah, you can make large adventures. There's a huge sandbox ones. But as an adventure, that's the, the mindset that I'm coming from, not the world-building setup. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, each individual DM, there's plenty of them that will make wonderful worlds. I'm not trying to sell them my worlds. My worlds are just a vehicle for their adventures. If they take all the, the characters and such in my world and just change it to their own world, it doesn't make a difference to me. It's an adventure that's important. Um, Does that make sense? Yeah, if it helps, what I mean when I refer to universalist games are, th are things like... Um, GURPS, Hero, um, Core, Core Savage Worlds, Fusion, um, 
those sort those sort of things. Games that are um, setting agnostic. Yes. Um, I, again, I didn't approach it as setting agnostic. I started off with one adventure. It was just a little thing that I did for myself, and then people played it locally and demanded that I expand it and do more. Mm-hmm. Now, so it, it started. It actually started off with the zombie apocalypse one. It, that just happened to be the thing, and then it moved into various other branches as other adventures were tried out, and. Generally speaking, just everything worked. So then I started making adventures for for people who wanted specific things. Yeah. Now, move moving uh, moving on from that. Something else that I did find interesting was the um, the fact that you that even though actions are dealt with simultaneously, you do have a a bit of an action economy through the use of. Um, stamina and the stamina pool. Oh, I, I would never use the word action economy for that. Oh. That oh, action economy is something that doesn't really play into the game at all. But uh, yeah, explain explain what you're you're talking about, and that everyone has a limited amount of stamina. Mm. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, the f- what I'm what I'm referring to when I, when I'm talking about action economy is is um the choices that you the choices that you have to manage, even if you can barely. Uh, manage them, and this isn't something that I limit to um, ta- to tabletop games. It's more of how it's more of how you express the your particular um, potential actions throughout a get throughout a given um, setup. Like the if I was if I was t- if I was talking about action economy and I was using um, Halo, I would say that its action economy is the golden triangle. Uh, the f- the fact that at any given point you have guns, grenades, and me- and melee um, at just a press of a button instead of as a separate cycling thing that was used in games in the um, past. And so okay, so you're that- referring to the effectively resource management. Yes. I mean, I know that's going back because in Halo you'd include your your shields as well as one of your resources that you can squander. Um, or use wisely, the, but yeah, I, I, get, I get your general idea. Yeah, that it's part of that whole the. But I wanted to, I wanted to focus on the um, active actions um, f- first and foremost. Hence, why I brought up what's been referred to as the golden triangle. I see. I think. Oh, well, you've you've clearly done your research because that's something I didn't actually put in the Kickstarter was how the health worked. Um, so, if your character has the default for it, for heroes is mm-hmm. is ten. 10 stamina points slash hit points. Mm-hmm. And I, I normally place them as tokens because players like that. It was just a feedback thing. Players like that rather than keeping it on paper. Mm-hmm. And if you every time you're performing a bunch of actions in a moment, you would flip one token over as you get tired out. If you take a, a glancing blow, like one or two points, you would flip another couple of tokens over. So then you'd have, say, seven left. Um, if instead of just taking a glancing bow, you took three points of damage, which would be an actual injury, you would remove three from the pool entirely. So there's three states to your health, which is full stamina, and then spent stamina, and then actual injuries, where you just remove it. Mm-hmm. So if you're just taking bumps and bruises, then after combat, you just rotate those, you just get those all back, because you don't care. And obviously any tiredness you have built up from fighting, you just regenerate that after the combat. Yeah. Uh, but any injuries, you would keep, and if you're playing a more complex game, you can get conditions as well to go with those injuries. Say it's a broken arm, or the sniffles, or whatever it is, based on the environment or the injury you've got. Mm-hmm. And with, now with that in, with that in mind, uh, there, I had I had also noticed when I was doing my research that there are there is a way to, um, get st- get stamina back in in a limited capacity by j- by um just playing defensively. Yeah, by basically doing nothing. Um, in minimum beta tests, there are war gamers as well as role players that play it. Um, I actually tested it with war gaming rules. It, again, it, it works fine. If, if you get the full book, you can see some stuff in that. But there were some players who they didn't take any magic users or anything fancy. They all just had guys with shields and swords, mm-hmm. and they liked to cycle so they could just hold off waves and waves and waves of mud men, which were the the monsters they were fighting, by cycling their guys back and forward so they could rest at the back for a bit while the others fought forwards. 
Uh, so they cycled the the two rows in the corridor of the four people and just keep going that way. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I mean, they destroyed everything because they knew exactly what they were doing. They're war gamers, but they they really struggled when they came across uh, puzzles and riddles, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but but that the advent the the test adventure is very customizable. Uh, the idea is that you t- you as a DM you know your players or you can just try things out. Um, there's the structure of how you build the dungeon on yeah. the fly. It's a magical dungeon, so you can build it on the fly based on, basically based on what your yeah. you know your players will like, whether that's combat or riddles or puzzles or agility tests. And as an aside, I do appreciate that. Oh, uh, the. For the core attributes are an acronym for the title um, Serial. Well, it's the other way around, really. I, I I just made the title from the core attributes. Well, it's 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 still it's still a it's it still applies as an acronym as much as um, Phase Rip is an acronym for the old TSR Marvel game. Mm. Well, the, the first yeah. one, not the not the second one. I do have to clarify because they made two. But, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, uh, the other since you since you brought up magic, I suppose this is as good a time as any for me to um, ponder into that. Is magic treated as just a another type of of um, skill use? Ah, well, yep. I put the the video up, and this is uh, magic is called uh, it's a multi part action, so it is skills, but you might use more than one skill, and you'll have to send more than one one die to various things. So as I mentioned earlier, when you have four dice, you can roll four dice or not roll four dice. The players generally have, if they have a skill four, they'll have more than four dice. They'll say have four red dice and three green dice and two yellow dice and one blue dice. Mm -hmm. They have that because they may roll more than one skill at a time. So you're sure they have a skill of four in their highest ability, so they could roll a maximum of four dice. But they don't need to roll them all in that ability. So you might say roll two for shooting and two for diving. Mm-hmm. which is your athletic skill. And by the same token, a magical spell, or even, even lock picking is the other example I use that's this very simple to understand. A lock might have three pins that are medium difficulty, so you need a four to get through them, a score, a score of four. So you could roll loads of dice, all your dice for that, and try and get four or in one moment on three pins, or you could do it over several moments while your friends are holding off a horde. And magic works in kind of a similar way. So if you're a pyromancer, you might put three dice into your pyromancy skill for the roll for a particular spell, and then one die for the blast skill, which would be the ability to shoot out your hand like Iron Man and hit a target. Uh, so you'd roll your three red dice and one yellow dice, say, and we'll put the three red dice into one of the vocal component, which is nice and simple, only needs a two, and then you'd store maybe a six for your power, so it's nice and powerful. But then if your other one's a one, you ditch that because it's useless. And unfortunately, you didn't get a good score for your your blast ability. So instead of casting that moment, you might choose to just keep holding back, keep charging up your power, let your friends fight the monsters until you've got things ready. And then in the next moment, you've held one of the die die aside, uh, which has got the six on for power, but the rest you can roll again. And you, you maybe roll another red and two yellows to make sure you get hit this time. So you get your extra red, and it happens to be a six. And then you could put it straight into the power, or you can put it into one of the optional components that the spell has. So instead of doing a fire blast, you put it into the area of effect mm-hmm. slot to make it a fireball and explode when it hits things. And hopefully you told your friends you were doing that, otherwise they, they wouldn't know to jump out of the way. Yeah. Well, a fireball is always addressed to whom it may concern. Yeah. <laughs> and there's somebody way in the way in the back with how with howitzers saying Y'all are talking some mad shit for some really solid-looking grid coordinates, but given given what you mentioned with um st- with stamina, I'm get I'm guessing that it's it's still something that you're taking stamina to do the action, and with if you're applying extra effects, is is the drawback of of that um it costing? Yeah, if you if you're charging up more power, you're going to start using up more stamina faster. Uh, so if you're not a very powerful caster, yeah, you can still spend a bit of time building up more power, but as you draw more and more power and charge it up, it's going to draw your stamina faster and faster and faster. So basically an extra one for every die you've held back. So you'll knock yourself out in a few rounds, so you can't charge too long. Mm-hmm. 
uh, a better tactic is if you're not a great caster and you've got another not great caster because everyone takes their turn at the same time the two casters can just pull their dice together and put them out and get things done a lot quicker so it, it makes for good fights against someone who's very skilled and someone who's not skilled whether that's spell casters or sword fighters the the idea is you can try and get it so that you have more dice going against them and they can't they can't deal with it yeah and given that given that um in the full book, I'm guessing you have more of a effect list in a build your own spell kind of way instead of a um, defined spell list. That's absolutely correct. There is a section, well, basically called making your own spells and multiple actions. Uh, so the the core book it does have a load of fire spells. It specifically goes through spire spells because they're nice and obvious, and from those you can derive your own ice spells or, or whatever you like. It's the section. In the core book, is all about making your own things. Mm -hmm. The individual adventures, so the, the Beaky Boys one that comes with the book, has various air spells, because that's just what they use. So it doesn't have fire spells, they use air spells. Um, and those spells are specifically written out what they do and what are the optional components and such. But for the, the core rules, it actually just tells you, here's how you make spells, here are some examples, here's how you'd put them together, here are some possibilities for what you would use, here are some things that you might want to incorporate in your universe, such as you may want to have physical components and you may want to have a, a limit as to what you can do by having, say, a, a crystal. The... The quest and chaos scenario, which is a lot about spells, most of the characters are magic users. That's they have to have a gem first of the type of magic. Well, it's not even magic; they call it they call it channeling energy. So they have to have the gem before they can do anything, mm -hmm. or they have to have crushed gem built into a tattoo that lets them temporarily do things. But obviously, that burns them and uses it up. Yeah, I say that's obvious. That's not necessarily obvious, but it does. So yeah, it's it's about. I want to enable more people to do their own thing, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to play things that I, I don't know, and the system would let people... Because it's not, it's not a heavy number system if you don't want it to be. It's not, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not shitting on GURPS. GURPS is all right, but GURPS is very spreadsheety. Oh, yes. And so, so there's that problem, and I wanted to get away with that. I want it to be... So even the mechanics are all idea-driven. I suppose is the best way. I was going to say narrative. It's not narrative because you don't you don't see what happens. You see what you want to do, and you try to do it within the rules mm -hmm. as best you can. And you might succeed, or since you're all doing things at once, three people might succeed, and the other guy trips over his own feet and falls on the floor and ruins the whole plan. That can very easily happen. But you're never sitting. In, you're never in a situation where you're sitting waiting for other players to decide what they want to do, but you've got an idea, and then when it gets around to your turn, that's gone because things have changed, because, again, everyone's doing things at the same time. It's got to be about having a problem, working together to solve that problem in the best way you know how with the skills. And the ideas can be absolutely crazy, but that's half the fun of, of a tabletop game. Oh, yeah. Now, with that in mind... When it, I'd like to talk a bit on character creation. Yeah. Is since we brought up GURPS and um, I've just I've described I described GURPS as a borderline cry for cry for help at times because because of the fact <laughs> that look, I like I like don't get me wrong I don't hate GURPS but no, it's I okay. just, it's just I just love get, I love giving um I love giving GURPS stands a lot a lot of shit because they keep telling me. That GURPS is the only game you need, you need because it can run anything. In yes, you can, but much much like much like how, um, potentially speaking, anyone could anyone could be a street level superhero, or anyone yeah. could do the practical jokes that I do that I do that I told you about before we went live, but not ev but um just because anyone can doesn't mean everyone will, and. GURPS requires multiple session zeros, and once the expansion books come out, then it becomes a cry for help. Um, <laughs> especially, okay. especially... I mean, fair enough. Because I'm, I'm more when it comes to the, like trying to do anything, I'm more in the the Savage Worlds camp on that. But obviously, that has its other issues, and it is it can be very, very random. Savage... Just the way the the dice the dice work stacking works. Yes. It can be hilariously random or terribly random, depending on what mood you're in at the time. 
I once called Savage Worlds the Goldilocks of universalist RPGs. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, not too crunch, not too much. It doesn't have too much crunch, doesn't have too little crunch, just a decent middle ground. Uh, but with character creation in Saril, is that a point based affair? Yes. Um, essentially, it is a points based affair. There's no. I know there's still a, a few old school people who like the rolling three dice and seeing what you get, path or or whatever the, the random systems are. But it is generally a point system where, for I was going to say for obvious reasons, but all your your stats start off at zero by default, and and that doesn't mean nothing useless can't do anything. That means the modifier is zero. Because it wasn't made in the seventies, like D and D, D and D has this its system which is based on three dice, which is why it has a weird system that a twelve is a plus one and a thirteen and a fourteen is a plus two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. If your stat is a one, that's a plus one. If it's a minus one, it's a minus one on that particular stat. Uh, the other thing that's quite common is that a lot of skills will use two attributes rather than one. Say it might be strength and logic. So a heavy rifle. The, the rifles use strength and logic, and the pistol uses agility and logic, mm -hmm. just because it's a, a different skill set. Um, so the, they're very simplified in that sense, uh, but you also get different points for your attributes, which is commonly, for, for most basic adventures, you get one attribute point, mm -hmm. that's it. So, so everything's zero, and you can assign one point. And... Mm -hmm. As you go up, if you want a two to get a, a skill to two, you actually need three points because it, it costs you one to get it to one, three total to get it to two. Cause you, you pay the number that you want to get it up to from the number below. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very easy to have a character that, that's middling at most things. But to offset that, the skills tend to push you towards specialization a little bit more mm -hmm. um, by letting it be cheaper to buy similar skills. So if a skill is similar to another skill, such as rifle and pistol, if you want to be a gunslinger, you'd probably want both of those. You only have to pay half cost for one of them mm -hmm. as you build it up because it's a similar skill to the other one. And that's true of um, knowledge as well. So if you get one area of knowledge that's similar to another, or what's called expert knowledge, which is you've got a general skill, such as science, mm -hmm. but beyond that, you've got the expert knowledge. You choose science and then you choose, say, biology as your expert knowledge. Mm -hmm or let's say physics is your expert knowledge, then it's half point. Because your science is your base skill, then your expert knowledge would be cheaper for chemistry after you've got physics mm -hmm. or any other layer of specialization. Uh, so the idea is that the the attributes would be hugely costly to specialize in one particular thing. and But the, the skill sets are a little more attuned to players focusing more on one archetype you can make that archetype up yourself by using say two sets of i suppose it'd be similar to multi-classing you have two sets of similar skills that you like to focus on or you could be a generalist and just take a bunch of things that you fancy it's not yeah. that important but the skills play a bigger role than your natural attributes your natural attributes will help in whatever skills that your natural attributes would help in but you're more focused on what skills your character takes and develops rather than how he was born and I'm guessing the f fact that you can go with a more specific specialized build or a wi or a wider um, generalist build is to it is to address the sunken cost issue that can sometimes happen with point based skill design where somebody's put points in a skill but they're disincentivized into putting points in a new skill unless they absolutely have to because that skill is going to fall behind compared to the rest of their stuff. Yeah, that doesn't tend to happen. It's more a case of, do I want to hold on and make myself really good with one particular skill, or do I start taking some more interesting other skills? That's the, like I said, I've done a lot of beta testing, and that was the the question that came up. No one thought, oh, this skill's going to fall behind. That doesn't happen, because to get to a, a small level of skill is is very cheap. So you get to a point in the story and you might be awarded, say, three three points for a trip, not for attributes, three points for skills. Getting new attributes is very rare, unless it's a very long campaign. But you know, so they get three points. Uh, 
it's quite common for someone to say, right, I'm going to save one of those points for later and get a new skill at level two. Because mm-hmm. that's nice and cheap. But there, there are going to be other people say, ah, oh, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to get my level two up to level three. Yeah, uh, that that was the conversation that people had because obviously the players all talk about what they're going to do and what their character is going to do and what they think narratively would work for their character. Would they focus on one thing? Mm-hmm. And that that develops naturally. Nothing to do with me as the DM. As the players play it, they decide who their characters are because you know, no one has a great idea of who their yeah. character is. Even if they've written five pages of backstory, they they don't really know until they've played them for a while. Mm-hmm. That's that's my experience. You could disagree with that. But always my experience is that they get into their character as they go. No one, or very few people, start right off the bat knowing who they who their character is and how they play. In my experience, it's been a little of column A and a little of column B. It all it ultimately depends on um, the pl- the player in question. Some people will have a will have a lengthy idea in advance, and some people um, won't. Um, to even out the playing field, I usually have everybody go in relatively blind during session zero. Um, hmm. And ha- if they haven't, if they have an idea, um, isolate it from me until until that session zero comes in, so I can so I can improvise with it. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, but I will ad- I will admit that full on full. Now, f- before I get to my next question, there's one clarification that I need. I need to follow up on. Um, is it a case where it's a universe? It's a universal point setup where you've got a budget of X amount of points to spend on attributes, skills, equipment, and whatnot. Or is absolutely it ca- not. It's is- by the adventure. When you start the adventure, um, you will have a, a budget for that adventure. Mm-hmm. Um, so. If you're having a long campaign, then everyone starts in the same place. It's not It's not really built for, say, West Marches. West Marches? West Marches. It's not that kind of thing. No, you, you got have a bunch of different right adventures. The first time. And... <laughs> uh, well, so, I, I mean, the one I'm writing now is the Clone Cargo Calamity one, and you get one attribute points, you get two, well, you get 10 divided by the player plus two skill points. Mm-hmm. So it's the number of two. so everyone gets a few few skill points and two. Uh, they also start with a bunch of mandatory skills just because that's what works in this adventure because they're all clones, they're all trained the same way, and then they get their specializations. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's entirely down to the adventure. Um, and the Beaky Boys one, which is the very first one that most players will play, this is a simple dungeon crawl. You start with no attribute points to spend because we don't teach players about that until they've played it. They get they get an attribute point halfway through the game. Uh, that's when they get an item that gives them an attribute point. And they're not even told about attribute points. They're saying they're told to choose one skill at level three and two skills at level two. Mm-hmm. That, that's all they're told. So it's entirely down to the adventure. Uh, partly, again, because I want people to create their own stuff. So I don't want to set down really strict rules. Do what works for you in your adventures. Uh, it, it details out how points work, how to use them, how to set them up for a game in the core rules. But the idea is that Sorry, cat entered. Uh, the idea is to set them up the way that you would want to run your game. So, if you want people to have lots of really powerful attributes at the start, go for it. But most of the most of the adventures that people tend to want to play emulate someone around. I hate to use D and D as a reference again, but fifth to seventh level. That's the kind of ideas. Uh, that was it. Was the most the most popular area. Before people bo- got too bogged down in their in their classes and such, they yeah. they liked adventures of those because they didn't feel they could do anything oh. at level one. Yeah, I've I've ta- I've tackled that issue um, in the in my own way in my own way in the past, and I've I've found that the the low level high level debate is one that's a bit more complicated than people think. Um, oh yeah, the narr- the narrative is oh it get, it gets boring once you're leveled into the teens. But I'd I'd say it's a combination of a few factors. One is just a lack of support at the high at the higher levels, kind of the inverse of the problem that um, Blizzard has had with World of Warcraft, where they build their raids for those world for, for those world first crowds, which are a minority of a minority of a minority. Yeah, um, and yeah, and understandably, you've got the same the problem that. If you in the teens, your DM generally has to do a lot more setup and put a lot more work into to keep things interesting. The other factor 
is the way challenge rating works, oddly enough. Because challenge oh, yeah, rating is... Challenge like, I've never been... Yeah. I wasn't a fan of it back in 2000. Um, that has not changed. And it's partially <laughs> due to the fact that it relies on a, it relies on a few too many assumptions for my liking. Since yep, very much the so. The idea is this is the level... this. This is the average level to work with of a balanced party of four, but that's assuming you're dealing with a balanced party of four. So that's two assumptions right out of the gate. The second is I've always found challenge rating to be very poor at helping players and helping um, GMs especially um, find ways to have the, uh, the particular kit of the monsters that they're throwing at the players interact with each other. Essentially, yeah, essentially I, I mean, a, a, a collection of individuals instead of a team. Yep. I mean, that that's a general problem. Well, again, that, that problem doesn't occur in Saral because the team all work together. It's They all take their turn at the same time, and that includes the monster. So you never get a situation where you go, oh, we've won initiative, because you don't roll for initiative, you take it in Saral, it's your choice. And so... You walk in, and then you get initiative, and then you all wail on the monster that dies before it can do any special abilities. That just doesn't happen. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I don't, I don't like the challenge, the challenge rating at all. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's something that's fairly, sim- fairly simple in Cyril because you can look at the skills of the player and add up the dice of the relevant skills in any given situation. So if it's all combat skills, you add up all the combat skills that people have in the dice, and that's their, effectively, what kind of monster you'd be looking at. So if you have three players with nine and one player that can't do anything, then a fairly reasonable combat would be a monster that has a rating of nine, and that just means it has nine dice total to use. Mm. So you can actually change any monster, because monsters have all their abilities and such that they can do various things. Say the mud monster can throw rocks, in any direction, it can attack with its big arms forward, but its small arm can only flail around backwards because it's useless. So the the tactic generally is to try and surround it, distract it with someone, and then have someone else come in from from behind where they're not going to get beaten up. But the idea is you can just literally add up the numbers. So if you're fighting something that has double the number of dice that you have, well, then you're in trouble. But if you're fighting something... If you're a new player, something with the same number of dice as your party... Is a decent challenge. Mm-hmm. If you really know what you're doing, if you're like a war gamer, that's actually fairly easy. So it, yeah. it's easier in that sense. You still need to know your players. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not going to lie there. You still need to know who your players are and what they're relevant, relatively capable of. If they're all idiots mm-hmm. and they're just going to try random stuff, you don't want to throw something that's a huge tactical nightmare at them. But generally yeah. speaking, it's quite easy as long as you can do basic addition. It's mm-hmm. quite easy to figure out yeah. what's a decent challenge. What um. What certainly ha- what certainly helped me when it com- when it comes to dealing with the issue is and this is something I've told people think of think of the um think of the player side and the GM side as um as as a collect as essentially sports teams mm-hmm. uh, like how like how in how you ha- you have defense you have defense midfield and the, and, atta- and attack air areas in fo- in football you have you ha- you have your fo- you have your fullbacks you've got you've got your sweepers your stri- your strikers each of them having a a particular um focus on what on what they're supposed to be doing um in a br- in a broad sense and obviously this is this isn't a one this isn't a one to one thing but i think you see the method to the madness here oh yeah you're trying to add up the the strengths and weaknesses of each party mm mm-hmm. mhm and then make something that's entertaining, even if it's not balanced. Yeah. Something will be good for everyone to take part in. I mean, um, I mean, the, I mean, um, as far if I'm getting if I'm gonna keep using the fo- the football references, I'm pr- I'm pretty sure, and anybody playing Man United doesn't doesn't see it as a balanced thing because they, because it's gonna be their free win for the day. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. sometimes that's great for the the party to have that, especially if they've oh. just come off the back of something that's a slog. Yeah. Although if I really wanted to be mean, I'd say Tottenham Hotspur is is what qualifies <laughs> for that to the point where their fans chant, "We're you're nothing special. We lose every week." 
I know I'm breaking yeah, some. Nice I know I'm, I know I'm breaking some rule by making Premier League jokes, but I make jokes about it, about every sport I can get my hands on, and I don't play favorites. Everyone is. A, a, oh, a, I'm a, definitely a, of the opinion that nothing's off the table when it comes to jokes. The only rule is it should be funny. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if it gets a giggle at me, I'm happy. Yeah, but the the point is, the point is 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 that when you have when you have it as a, when you have it as a collection of individuals, it's hard to make make it make them mesh, and in doing so. It's it's the equivalent of a chess match where every where you have nothing but pawns. Mm. And I know so, I know some might say, well, well, what about um, what about checkers? You can king in checkers, and that changes how something's gonna move. Yeah. Oh, uh, so it's. I mean, every every move you make in checkers obviously changes the board entirely. Yeah. But you don't you don't have four players in checkers, so you don't run into the problem of no. <laughs> or five players, including the DM. Um. I have done. I have done four-player chess. It, it it is very much a thing, and it is very chaotic, which is part of the appeal. Oh, and of course, of course, if you look at if you look at the way people utilize, say, a, say a deck of cards in a trading card game, it's the monsters are not just a collection of individual monsters. Um, it's one. Yeah. It's one piece of the whole. And yeah, I don't think D and D is designed. I mean, I know what you're going for, but I don't think D and D is designed very well around the idea oh. of fighting. I know they say it is, but fighting multiple different monsters that are supposedly work together. There's a few like the Mind Flayers and their gang that all work together. There's hobgoblins and goblins, or orcs and goblins Oddly that can enough, work together. The gang. The addition of D and D that I'm supposed that I'm told I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because they don't pay me. Actually made an, actually made an attempt to try and have that kind of team play. Presumably, um, you mean four. Yeah, because yeah. The, I, I'm okay with four. There's a, there's a fair bit of tracking. The only issue with four really is the amount of tracking you have to do. So it's not yeah. too bad. The in in fourth, you had you had you had different variations of each individual monster. It what it wasn't like say there was this one stat block to rule them all for say mm -hmm. a kobold. There were di there were yep. different variants and different positions of them, and some suggestions on how to create how to um, create a team of kobolds to build to build around a certain XP budget. Oh, uh, there's a really good um, well, it's a book or well, short book. It's a paperback of how to kill your party with kobolds. It's quite funny. Yeah, I. It's, um, it's, it's all about that idea. The first, yeah. the first. The first time I played D and the first time I played Fourth Edition, um, the party ended up getting wiped by a by a bunch of kobolds because his kobolds are awesome. <laughs> well, in Fourth they had they were insidiously easy to um, shift, and since even the shift doesn't isn't a lot of movement, it's movement that doesn't provoke AOOs. So mm -hmm. they would do these annoying hit and run tactics that the party just couldn't figure out because they figured they could just. They figured, oh, it's kobolds. We can just bum rush them. Well, you actually got to hit them in order in order to bum rush them. That's part of the problem there. Oh, and yeah, kobolds always played better with traps and hit and runs. That's, well, that's what the idea is all about. Yeah, they're meant to they're be not, on the. They're not. They're not goblins. They're meant to be on the back foot, and when you're on the back foot, you don't fight fair. Yeah. And like if. if if I'm the, if when we we see this we see this in conflicts where where somebody where where one side has either a um either a new either a numerical or an equipment advantage so they rely on um unorthodox or asymmetric tactics to mm -hmm. make to make up for the shortcoming of not having the bigger guns in the fight. Uh, but that, that's always more fun than doing anything else. It's always better to have to have a problem to solve as a player's anyway. Yeah, and with the, now with that in with that in mind, um, since the since since it is it is very much built around um, skills. Mm -hmm. When when it comes when it comes to th when it comes to things, part of the part 
part of the reason I asked about the point system is a lot of ga a lot of games have this you will have this um shared po shared pool of points and that and then say okay okay here's what here's what you can spend on everything from at attributes to skip to skip to skills and ju and just throw you right into the middle of it um one example I always use for this is Shadowrun it's like okay you've yeah. got you've you've got x amount of karma spent and the and these are the things you can spend it on so go so get to spending um but it's well, it's it sounds like Cyril isn't really going to fall into that trap because there's not a there's not a whole lot of vectors that you can spend points on from what i'm seeing you can spend you get points for well you get points for attributes mm -hmm. skills knowledge and in some you also get some points for equipment, so you can take so much, yeah. so many items, or but that's specifically for the the adventure. Is you it... can, if you read through the whole book, mm -hmm. there is a way to convert one type of point to another if yeah. you want. But I don't. So out of a... all the people I asked, which was hundreds, mm -hmm. no one actually cared about that except yes. one guy. It was just one guy was really adamant that he wanted to, to have a, an open point system like Shadowrun. Yeah, so the way you're describing it, it's, it sounds like there's a separate point pool for attributes, a separate point pool for skills, and so on. Yeah, that's exactly right. Oh. So a, a, attributes would be very, very rare to upgrade because mm -hmm. you don't want the, the strong guy to suddenly become the smart guy as well just because he picked a couple of points up in the middle of a, a coffee or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so skills are far more common. Whether you do it by the skills that they use and you give them points that they can use relative to those skills or let them do whatever you like is entirely up to you as the DM. Mm -hmm. There's there's a few methods of doing it listed. The basic is you just give them points, let them do what they like. Yeah. And then there's the, they've been doing these things, so they have to pick a skill that's relevant to, say, their strength because they've been doing a lot of strength stuff. So they have to use the points on skills relative to those. That That's the other method. Mm-hmm. But like I said, most commonly people just wanted to sort out their own narrative. So you give them the points at point parts which makes sense, like they've just accomplished something great and they've got a day off to, to do some training. So you give them the points, you let the players think narratively as to what they want to put it in. And if they want to put it into something that you don't think they've got any way of learning, then they can usually come up with something. You could you could say no as the DM, but most of the time you can say, "Oh, I wanted to learn how to use a shotgun." And you say, "Um, well, where is that going to be? Oh, there's a guy on the edge of town who's a duck shot shooting guy, and he can teach you a bit." Day, so yeah, go for it. Yeah. It's it's generally nice. Most players like to think of narrative ways that the characters do things anyway. So because DMing and being players, it's not very combative. It's generally collaborative storytelling. So you want to accommodate what they're doing, and generally, I know there's exceptions to this, but most players want to accommodate whatever universe they're playing in and the narrative of their character. They don't want to do anything that's ridiculously out of character. So they, they tend to work, basically give them more freedom, and they tend to work more with how you want things to go anyway, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now... But yeah, but yeah I, don't, I don't bog people down by giving them just tons of points to use and they have to put so many into attributes and so many. They have a simple one attribute point and in some of the bigger games they may have 20 skill points to spend as they like, but there are suggestions mm. of which skills are most useful, which skills are less useful yeah. or less commonly used. And the, the players will always surprise you by using one of the less common skills in innovative ways, and that's fine. That's, that's great, in fact. Mm -hmm. Um. Within the core book, do you plan on ha having sections to give advice if if um, a GM or a ta or a table wants to build their own skills that aren't in the core book? Yes, there's a mm. it's not a huge section, but it, it is there. But I mean, there's a whole section on building your own scenarios entirely and how you'd want to do that. Sections on how you can level up. Um, yeah. But the, being a DM is a, is a large section and a large. A large part of the DM is is about making new things rather than here's how you DM this specific thing and here's a bunch of tables for it. We don't even bother with tables of random generation tables because that would be scenario specific. Um, the DM guide is is fine for for uh, for Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. sorry, um, because that, that's got tons and tons of tables in it. 
random roll tables and such. Mm-hmm. But that's because it's for something very specific. Oh yeah. This this doesn't have it's got tables, but those tables are for doing math calculations to help you do things like um what are the chances of getting rolled? So if some a DM's not particularly good at calculating the odds of something, there's a there's a, an entire page that just has mathematical probabilities, like percentage probabilities that someone will get a score if they have this number of dice and they they can hold as many back. Uh, so like I said, I want to enable DMs to run whatever they want, mm-hmm. and the adventures I give them are just to give them ideas and flavor. Sure, I'll build up these universities, and some people get very attached to those universities. But that's not my primary goal. My primary goal is for, say, in, in five years or so, for people to take away this stuff and make their own thing that I can play. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a totally different flavor and things that I haven't seen before, but it's a system that doesn't annoy me because I can't do something just because it's not my turn, for example. that yeah. That's one that bugs a lot of people. Or that they can't work together. Because obviously there's, there's loads of players who want to catch spells together, but you can't really do that in, in most games. And thus, it's it's simple. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, obviously, with a lot of the vi- a lot of the videos and the like, I did see that it's building around um, grid combat. Um, is the yep, op- there, is the- good? I was going to say there there's a page. The grid combat is been, it's only grid combat there because it's very easy to understand. The units are arbitrary. Whether you use grids or hexes or um, values of numbers, or quite often, um, in the in the book, it has a whole page dedicated to the different types that you might want to use. Because mm-hmm. uh, you might want to use zoning, for example. So you just say, if you're using theater of the mind, you can say corridor left, corridor right, and then kitchen, mm-hmm. and you don't need to care about the exact numbers. If you're playing on a battlefield, then quite often it's measured pieces of string. So if characters get a movement of two, the default, then they have a piece of string that's two inches long. So you just put that from one end of the base and put it to wherever. So you don't have to travel in a straight line. So if you want to go around the corner, you can measure in two 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 inch units that you've put aside or one inch units. Mm-hmm. But you just use a piece of string. So it doesn't care. The, the system itself doesn't care about the, the grids. And in space combat, I use half cocktail sticks. I've, I've made little plastic tokens, but half cocktail sticks is super easy mm-hmm. because in space combat, when you're using Newtonian physics, you keep your momentum. So you put your cocktail sticks down and you leave them there because that's your momentum. So when you, you t- take your do your movement, such you just move yourself to the end of the, the cocktail sticks, mm-hmm. and then you move the cocktail sticks back to where they were, and then adjust if you put your thrusters in the opposite direction or added a new vector, and let you let you fly along perpetually like that. So yeah, the grid system is only there to make it easy for people who are new to it to understand because they're used to that. Mm-hmm. That certainly that certainly makes sense. And with that, in, with with that in mind, um, I did obvious. Obviously, there's the ver- there's the various um, adventures that you have um, pl- that you have planned within within it. Um, some of the, some of them being more el- some of them being more elaborate than others. Like, I think. I think you've got a few that are going to be one shots, and then some that are a bit more involved. Like yeah, it's just because of the ways when I was testing things out and running the betas, some of them are very small and some of them are very large. Mm-hmm. I'm getting more of the the smaller one shots out, and something I found was very popular with beta testers are the the one shot setup pages, which is a single page that just has a bunch of rules for setting up a character. Here's the scenario. And bloody blah, blah, and there's some here's some random events that happen. Here's a couple of tables of random things that could happen. Here's the win condition, and such, and you just give that to a DM because a lot of DMs they don't want to read through fifty pages of precise information. They just want a setup, and then they can wing it from there. So yeah, they'll have a few story beats or important things that could happen or events like if you do this, this will definitely happen. But then you take it; they take it in their completely their own direction. And I find that people do that even when you do give them fifty pages. Uh, so there's not going to be many I'm not going to do anything that's going to be A, B, C, D, E, F as the, the story no matter how big it is the The biggest one that I've run so far is the, the Wild West it's, it's Weird West it's got time loops and all sorts in it so, so it's demons and time loops but it's set in the, weird, the, the Wild West but the players didn't know it was weird until they ran into the, the grubs that went inside people and exploded so 
the the idea with that is it's a, it's an open sandbox that takes place over three days. It's only three days, but this is because you can get in a time loop that can happen more than once. And the the campaign was well over a hundred hours for several groups that tried it, which is completely the opposite end of the Beaky Boys one, which is that's the, the one that does hold your hand. Um, but you can run that in four hours if you want, if you want to cut out half the rooms, because it's a great it's a starter adventure that's very familiar to people who are coming over from Dungeons and Dragons. But I will say that I will never, never bother doing a linear story because I'm not that interested in it. But something that has three small open world acts, I suppose, like there's a setup and then there's this thing going wrong and then there's another location. That's fine by me. That's that's what they, not the Clone Calamity one, that's a small one, but the, the Parallax one where you're trying to steal a spaceship. That's a heist. It's designed as a heist and it's got three acts. But in those three acts, you can do pretty much whatever you like and how you go about it and which AI you put on your spaceship to give it whatever personality, that's up to the players. Well, Mm -hmm. the DM might say, no, I'm not doing funny accents or no, I'm not going to have the AI of a stripper. Like it's it's the AI that runs the strip joint. But if the the DM's up for it, then yeah, the the player can get, because their ship gets knackered at the start and they have to kind of rebuild it in the first act before they set off to go on their investigation side of things. And then they've got the actual heist at the end. So those three acts of that. So there's never going to be a situation where it's purely linear because I, I personally hate that. If someone else uses this to make that, that's great. That's fine for them. But it, I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to make something that's 50 pages of this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and have the players just jump through those hoops. So yeah, there's going to be huge adventures, but they're they're huge and they're dense and they're full of possibilities, not things that definitely happen. Mm-hmm. They're mostly they're mostly built around all the characters that are involved, all the NPCs that are involved, and what those NPCs would do, and what, what they're like, and what their goals are. So then the DM would still have to figure out how they would act in a particular situation, because it's not my job to tell a DM how they're going to run their game. I find that yeah. kind of offensive. It, once once they take it, it's theirs, and they make the universe their own. Yeah, and I'd I'd love to watch someone else do it. it it's one of the ways I ran my beta tests. Was the first one I'd run myself in case it was anything major. But the beta test after the first one, I would tend to give it to another DM, record it, watch it. I mean, some of it was during COVID time, so I was, I was literally asking them for, to video it and send me the video after dropping a box of stuff off at their house. And then they'd send me it back and I'd see. They'd do crazy things that I would, would never have thought of, and that's that's fine. That's good. Yeah. Ooh, cat attack. Now, I'm guessing that the big reason why each each skill is associated with two attributes is to prevent things like the um, god stat issue that can happen. Yeah, it's to it's to make people. I mean, I know what you mean by god stat, but it was simpler than that. The initial reason, yes, it solves that problem, but it was more to have characters that had more depth than they were the strong guy, mm-hmm. because that they get the same benefit. Um, depending on what like, skills they chose to use or what weapons they chose to use, if they were, say, strong and agile or strong and logical or strong and intuitive. I deliberately don't have an intelligence stat as such because often that comes down to the player and you can't just say, well, he would figure it out because he's intelligent. It, it tends to be very awkward in games when, you come, when you're playing with, say, a bunch of kids and some of them are much smarter cause, than others because they're not in that stage of development yet. Mm. It's better have some be intuitive and they can figure things out and and players will quite often lean to what they like so if they feel they're intuitive um they'll put those stats on so if, if you're the kind of person who likes to charm and manipulate people then you tend to go for intuitive um, conversational skills whereas someone else might go for logical conversational skills to convince people and some of the some of the skills allow you to use both of those traits or either of those traits rather than both of those traits depending on how you're presenting your argument Mm-hmm. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. No. So, what did you actually ask? <laughs> was, it was. It was more. It, it was more about le- about diving into the reasoning behind the the two. Ah, yes, yes. Up. It was. It was and, to have the players think and round out their characters yeah. more and make them more than one note. And uh, I should note what I mean by the god stat is like how cer- in some games certain attributes are end up having the lion's share of importance. Um, if I'm using D and D as an example, um, dexterity is the big one, just because of um, how many things yeah. cascade out from dexterity. 
as opposed yeah, to... I mean, because it's class-based, you also have a primary stat per class as well, which I'm not so keen on. I would like to see big, hefty, powerful druids that are not particularly wise, but are in tune with nature, but you can't really get that much in, in D&D because the classes are they're quite narrow in how, how they develop if you want to have your character not even min-maxed, but competent at their job. Yep, I um, I have had I have had a running meme of of in, mo of in most fantasy games, and even some even some science fantasy games of making the muscle wizard. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know the it start it started as a shit post where somebody was like, "Okay, we we have we have these different we have these different types of casters for that rely on." One of one of the mental attributes. Why not one for the physical one? And then the that, that started the muscle wizard meme. And eventually, I just eventually I decided to build two muscle wizards who you who cast magic by bodybuilder style flexing. And of course, I made them into XPs of Hans and Franz from from that old SNL sketch. <laughs> So did you make new rules up for that specifically, just for that? Oh, um, I tweaked. I tweaked a few. I tweaked a few things here and there, but the easy, the easy part was the flexing. That was just, that was just their um, that that was just their gesture casting. Um, yeah, because there's no rules on what the gesture actually has to be. So I'm like, well, did you still use? Well, did you still use intelligence for the amount of spells they could have and such? Um, no, I used constitution. Right. Yeah, because obviously that that would. Severely limit them, unfortunately. If they, but yeah, you, you have to break the game to make the game. There. Well, rule zero exists for a reason. <laughs> Indeed. Um, especially since a habit of mine is that I like to give my players very powerful but very unsafe weaponry. Mm -hmm. Um, like I've I've had a recurring thing of of this um this ba this banshee crossbow, or sometimes I call it the sonic crossbow, or whatever. Whatever I'm calling it this week, but it's basically an XP of the noisy cricket from Men in Black. Yeah, it it is very powerful. It does a lot of it does a lot of damage, and it does and it's a it's a breakthrough thing. So it's going to keep it. It's going to hit what you shoot what you shoot at and whatever's behind it. The problem is the blow the um the effect goes both ways. So you so you're going to be sent flying. Every time you fire the thing, and if you hit a wall, you're going to be taking wall banging. Oh, um, and no, and no, you can't lean up against a wall to. to no, you get squashed negate. then. No, no, you're still you're still taking wall da you're still taking wall damage like you got hit with a bull rush. Oh, um, right. Or there, there's been th there's been things like the like the um, up button, which is. A rune trap you put on the floor, and when someone steps on it, they go straight. They go straight up for about six seconds at um, forty kph, um, which is very ha it's very handy to have when you're in when you're indoors. <laughs> oh yeah, um, and propped you lift. Yeah, in I, th and the thing is because because of how I wrote it, it doesn't matter how light or heavy you are, you're going up at the same speed. I see. Uh, because a dra in one campaign, a dragon ended up stepping on it, hit hit the ceiling in a cave that was lined with adamantite, so that's not budging. And well, you have an unstoppable force and an immovable object, so I think you can figure out what happened. Well, technically, nothing if that's the case. No, just sat there for ages. No, <laughs> you. I presume it got squashed. Yeah, it got it got squashed like you'd squash a car in a compactor, and everybody had to everybody had to take um co um fort saves to avoid losing their lunch. You know, because they just saw a dragon literally get cru literally get crushed to death, and hear all the bo hear all the bones and stuff and stuff breaking. Yeah, as in well Sarah, the an actual force. Yeah, stat when you're doing things. So if you're fighting something big and it hits you, you will f fly a number of units. And, and just like you said, if you if you hit a wall, whatever number of units you've still got left to travel is the amount of damage you take. Yeah, um, simple. I had argued with a GM once because I wanted a 
I wanted to have a monk who managed to repurpose ring, a ring of ram into um, brass knuckles. Yeah, absolutely. So he'd, <laughs> so he'd, pu he'd punch... He'd, and what, then, what's the uh, argument there? Huh? What's the argument against that? I had... Um, he had he tried to he tried to he tried to talk me into into only you only using one ring of ram. I'm I'm like, there's four there's four holes. He has four rings yeah. of ram on each fist. <laughs> and he he eventually he eventually relented because I because I told him that he could be that with that setup he could basically pinball pinball um battlefields just to just tossing enemies about. Yeah and. Apparent, apparently, he liked the idea so much that he ended up making, he ended up making his own. He ended up house ruling, um, how this is going to work if, if say, he, if say he hits and and the enemy ends up hitting somebody else. You know, the whole three body collision thing. Yeah. Which which resulted in me setting th setting up um, um, encounters so so that it would so that one would bounce from the other like the world's worst Rube Goldberg experiment. Uh, because apparently I get way too many ideas from old Looney Tunes cartoons. Uh, they generally find that the cat's eating my arm. <laughs> they generally yeah. work quite well. And good to talk about the similar thing. And Saril, if you win a round of a combat, well, a moment of combat. Mm -hmm. You even if you haven't damaged them, you get to move them one square away from you, or move yourself back. Mm -hmm. So, you, if you want to disengage rather than making a run for it, generally you'd want to win the moment of combat so they can't attack you in the next moment because it's not generally moving and then see what they're doing and then doing it. Oh, it's all happening at once. So yeah. it's quite common for you to kick someone off a building or off a bridge or whatever because you just happen to be in the right place at the right time. It's a Plus, it's an entertaining form of combat for a lot of people. One of the rules Swash of fiction button. is if you are shot from a high place, you will fall to your death. <laughs> Bullets may do you in, but gra but gravity is the one who gets who gets the kill credit. That's how that's how this works. That's entirely reasonable. Oh, plus I've I tend. Truth be truth be told, I tend to prefer a, a more zone like approach because whenever I set whenever I set up encounters, I take way too many cues from uh, mar from martial arts movies because I grew I grew up on, I grew up on that I grew up on that kind of crazy, and I want people to um, find weird ass ways to utilize the environment as as a weapon as much as. Oh, um, yeah, definitely. As as much as they don't don't want to sit in a, in a flat arena. Flat um, arenas are generally boring. And you, yeah, at least at least throw a few pillars in there, if nothing else. Um, because of, because of that, some somebody somebody said, so wait, so wait, as long as as long as I can pick it up and throw it, I can count it as an improvised thrown weapon, right? I'm like, yeah. I want to pick I want to pick up this guy and th and th and throw him as a as a improvised ranged attack. Okay. Yep, if he's strong enough. Well, he he was he was he was strong enough that he could ju he could juggle people. So he so that's exactly what he did. He, he pulled the old I will hit a motherfucker with another motherfucker. Yeah. It's oh. Perfectly legit. I don't yeah. see why that wouldn't be legit. Like I I know I know some people want to, want to have it that they that they are taking that they're trying to do these serious stories. I'm like, no. You have it. You have. Well, you have a bunch there's of. There's a time and place. Where, there's a time and place, but when you have when you have tables full of genre savvy people, um, it sometimes it's best to embrace the stupid because because those kind <laughs> because those kind of things are gonna be these stories that they tell their friends about. Yeah, I, I get that. It, it depends on your group entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so there's there's plenty of people. Who run Call of Cthulhu as a farce? Because the base skill level is fifty if you're professional, which means you mess things up half the time as a professional at whatever skill. Yeah. So, so it it leans very. So if you've got a group that has a good sense of humor, it leans very well into the comedy aspect rather than the oh no end of the world aspect that you're supposed to play it as. I think the I th the. 
I think the la the last time that I ran Call of Cthulhu, I wasn't technically running it. I was running um, Delta Green in my own style. the the appro The approach that I ended up taking was that the player characters are the are technically the elite of the of the of their particular field, but they are the outcasts. They're the misfits. Um, the get the guys who are have a have have a few have a few screws loose and, te and tend to have bad luck when it comes to the whole collateral damage thing. Um, one of one of them having the policy of um, it's still of go of going into a stealth mission and n with no survivors because nobody can notice you if nobody's left alive to notice. Yep, the ultimate stealth weapon, explosives. Mm -hmm. um, he he is the type of person who would would breach a room using fr using frag, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or or um or would or would have would have um tra would have traps be the triggers for other traps. You know, somebody tries to disable the trap, and that's the trigger yeah. for another one. A Rip Goldberg machine of death. Pretty, pretty much, and or have um what he referred to as dummy traps. Traps that uh, that even when you set them off, they literally do nothing. They're meant to they're meant to be red herrings to catch um paranoid people. I was going to say they don't do nothing. They make someone paranoid. Well, a a, a paranoid person is just someone in possession of all the facts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know about yeah. that. But no, with that, with that in with that in mind, one other thing I was a bit curious about is whether or not you have whether or not you're planning on putting advice regarding um cu regarding custom equipment because well, everybody's going to want to trick out their particular um firearm, for instance. Yeah, there's a there's a section on even talking about the firearms that talks about if you're adding different types of ammunition because there's so many options you can have. Oh, yes. <laughs> depending on, on, on situations. Even even with the basics, the example I give in, in the core rules is giving two examples of armor penetrating rounds for 5.56. Even though that's very common, you get two different, two very different types and one's the tungsten core and the other one's depleted uranium. Yeah. They're both for penetrating armor but they both behave differently. So yeah, that's there. In the DM sections, there's a section about creating your own items and weapons. Specifically, like thinking about what they do, whether balance is important, how long they're going to have it for, etc. To, to set that up. I thought you were going to talk about sanity because of that. And <laughs> you're talking about Call of Duty. You know how You know how I said that I like giving my players dangerously unsafe weapons? Yep. Um, I have... It, I have gotten plenty of inspiration by looking at um, weird firearms or um, abandoned prototypes. Um, yeah, well, even it's... even the Wild West one, the the there's plenty of guns that have the unstable trait, mm -hmm. which means that they can just go off by accident. And the revolvers, if you if you have the the single action revolvers in the Wild West one, if you have them loaded with six bullets. When you're not knowing you're going into combat, if you're going to be dangerous enough to walk around with six bullets in them, as soon as you fumble something or fall over something, it's going to go off and shoot you in the foot, guaranteed. Yeah, but that's a that's a player choice because most of the time people did not have six bullets in their gun; they only had five in their six shooters mm -hmm. because it was so dangerous to have the six the six one in. Yeah, uh, like but one one example that I've that I've used is for for a cyberpunk campaign. I decided to take the um. I decided to take the concept of the Fat Mac and turn instead of turning it instead of it being a single shot, it's a um, semi-auto. And the reason I did that was because one of the players was a troll, and I'm not sure how fam familiar you are with the meta with the meta types in, Sh in Shadowrun, but trolls are big boys. Yep. So I figure he's he's gonna find he's gonna find a standard rifle dainty, and, and he's if he's gonna be that big. So he's going so he's to specific... duct tape several together at least. So he's going to specifically want some want something that fits his size, and something like a Fat Mac or a four bore rifle is go is going to fit, because um, well the four bore rifle it, the barrel is one inch in diameter, just to put things in perspective. 
Oh, nice. And yeah, that is a that is a single shot, a single shot that has a ridiculous amount of um of recoil. The they're 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 technically hunting rifles for specifically for like big African game because you need something that's mm -hmm. going to stop them so you don't get run over when say a, say a charging rhino or elephant is coming at you and you you shoot it with something smaller it it dies but it's still sliding because of all the momentum. Oh yeah. And well, it's, it it would die but it would tend to not die for a while. It would die later after it gored you. Yeah. And I had I added that he had a sniper rifle that was the size of a um punt gun. Mm -hmm. Which <laughs> The punt gun is it was a ridiculous method for commercial. I know, I know what it's, I know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, to, just take that, just take that kind of thing. So, so it's a, it's a case of you just have. But, him at but the as a sniper point. rifle, the the barrel length to the the aperture is probably not going to be that accurate anyway. <laughs> well, he was Even using a sniper rifle. He was using expl He was using explosive rounds that went that went off like um. Like it, like a missile, so it was. It wasn't accuracy. His accuracy was not really his priority. His priority was accuracy by volume. Yeah. So if he hit the right building, it would blow up anyway. So it's fine. Oh, well, if you fire enough bullets, you'll eventually hit something. And eventually. In I think I think in one in one situation he did end up setting off a chain reaction that did demolish a building, um, by accident, because he technically missed his target, but he managed to, he managed to hit a barrel which hit which hit something else which hit something else, and it ju and it just exploded out from there, um, partially because I wanted to end that particular encounter and also because I thought it would be just the right kind of stupid. Or brilliance, depending yeah. how you look at it. Like you, like how some, like somebody who to, who tosses a random grenade around a, around a corner that just happens to land in the right spot to take to take out most of the uh, um, enemies around the corner. Mm -hmm. But no, with with that in mind, what are, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for Sarrel? Oh, I could tell you the exact page count because it's all finished. <laughs> the basic document is not including the the other one as pages. I'm right down to the bottom. There's 140 pages in the core rules. That doesn't include the Beaky Boys Adventure, which is another 50 odd. Mm -hmm. so There's about 200 pages, which is pretty standard for a core book. Yep, and especially I try to keep everything succinct as much as possible. Yeah, the good the good old kiss method. Yeah, definitely. So there's there's plenty of examples in there. So I quite often go over the set of rules, and some people are more visual learners. So as well as as well as the videos, obviously the videos are quite easy for people to learn. But normally there's an explanation of various rules, such as the shooting and how how it works, on a page on its own, just just examples. So it was with four pictures and here's what's happening in each picture, both from a character point of view and from a the rules point of view. Mm -hmm. But with that, with that said, um, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Oh, it's always fun to talk nerdy. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for more on Cyril, or just or just to um, shit post about cer about certain archetypes within within the hobby, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, sadly for you, I I don't drink anymore. Oh. I had to, I had to I had to choose between alcohol and video games, and I chose video games back in college. Well, it was university, but. I didn't say it had yeah. to be alcohol. <laughs> right. <laughs> got a bottle of water here. That's about as exciting as I've got at the moment at this time of night. <laughs> but, of course, a sincere thanks also goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. 
and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!